Hello and happy Friday, everyone. I hope it's been a really, really good week for everyone so far and uh, you are ready to round it out with a really great presentation that we have for you this week. Um, my name is Damien and I work with our manufacturer partners and I will be in the background moderating this week's webinar. Um, since the development of the hardscape portion of the manufacturer connection back in 2018, I've been really excited and, and um, really wanting to get one of those partners on as a guest webinar presenter. And I'm really excited that we've been able to, uh, to line up this topic for you all today. Um, it's also been a while since we've had a hardscape focused session, which is nice to be able to get back into our rotation of topics. Um, now, we, we all kind of know space is really valuable to us as a, a landscape design community and that functional space doesn't just lay on one uniform level or, or plane. Um, you know, it has many different characteristics, it's many different dimensions. Um, but for a number of years, the design community has been, you know, developing solutions that better integrate the indoor and outdoor spaces. Um, that better connect horizontal and vertical surfaces and that allows for, you know, better utilization of built space for functional use. And today we have Brad Swanson of Unilock to talk to us probably more so about the latter than anything else. Um, more specifically, the evolution of rooftop spaces um, things to consider while designing these spaces and some of the solutions that are currently available for those uh, spaces. Um, before I do hand over to Brad, um, I just want to go over our typical housekeeping items. Um, as you know, we love to see your questions come through and I know our presenters are more than happy to hear and answer those. So when you do have questions, please, uh, throughout the webinar, please type them into the Q&A window, which can be accessed by clicking the Q&A button on your screens. Um, some questions can be answered by myself directly. Um, otherwise, we'll, we'll pick some select moments uh, throughout the presentation to ask Brad directly. And of course, we will have, um, you know, some, some time at the end to answer uh, questions as well. So uh, from here on out, I will hand over to Brad and he will take us underway. Thanks, Brad. Great. Thanks, Damien. Uh, welcome to Design Rooftop Amenity Hardscapes. My name is Brad Swanson. I'm the Director of Commercial Sales for Unilock Midwest. I've been with the company for almost 15 years and prior to that, I did practice as a landscape architect in Chicago for about 12 years. And so my background comes from a design background as well as, you know, plant material and layout, things like that. I did a lot of parks and rec and athletic fields. Uh, campus design was kind of my area of interest. Uh, Unilock, a company, we have uh, over 13 locations throughout the Midwest, upper northeast area with over 18 manufacturing facilities. And we have quite a few ground troops out there to help get samples and materials out to you to see what they look like uh, and work with their extensive dealer and contractor network in your area. And that includes areas uh, out west. Uh, we do have dealer networks in the, uh, the mountain states as well as uh, even out as far as California. Uh, we do have a rep that covers those areas. Uh, in terms of Unilock and what we've done for the industry, you know, we were one of the first uh, companies to introduce uh, heavy duty paving to North America. We were actually the first manufacturer in North America to make concrete pavers. And we did that back in 1972. Uh, we've been manufacturing permeable pavers for over two decades now. And uh, we've got quite a few different face mix technologies, which I'll kind of briefly mention today, as well as that uh, extensive uh, contractor network, as I just mentioned. 
Um, besides the you know unit paving, architectural slabs, and retaining walls, we do also have natural stone and porcelain tile. Occasionally, we'll, we'll help out with some architectural precasts when it makes sense to make it fit with our other units. And then we have all the accessories for your paving needs: so sand, pedestals, edging, all that kind of stuff. Sands and sealers as well. Some learning objectives, you know, first thing, um, we're gonna explain the kind of the evolution from ballast system to outdoor amenity spaces. I'll help identify the different systems that are out there for rooftop applications. And then we'll kind of evaluate the different materials that go into or are being used currently for roof deck spaces. And I do wanna talk a little bit about customization for concrete slabs and, and how that works. And then we'll uh, talk about some cost efficient layouts for your projects. Uh, in terms of the agenda, these are the different sections like uh, Damian mentioned. We will uh, pause between a couple of these for questions. So, uh, you know, write some down. Uh, so that's kind of our focus today are, are these six sections here. Um, and before I get started here, I, I do just want to take a moment to thank LandFX for giving us this opportunity to present. And so with that, let's talk about this rough rooftop evolution. Uh, this project you see here on the left side of the screen is uh, a project called 1035 West Van Buren and it's uh, in the city of Chicago. You can see the Sears Tower uh, photobombing my picture here but uh, it's a great uh, amenity space and so this would be the activity area of this uh, roof deck uh, application. So over the last few decades We've seen these exterior building spaces and roofs significantly transform from, you know, your basic utilitarian uh, type ballast roof to a highly programmed, environmentally conscious, people-friendly amenity uh, space for healthier lifestyles. Uh, in the roofing evolution, there's about five common building materials that we see. So you have your, your ballast and your single ply or liquid applied systems that are held down by material. You have an extensive roof garden, which is essentially like I would consider like a park, except it's on a roof. Uh, you have your pedestal system. Um, in the early 2000s, we started to see green roofing systems and kind of the combination is the outdoor amenity space. So let's take a look at some of these examples here. I'm sure you've all seen a ballast system or a single ply system, you know, still very commonly used on a lot of buildings. Uh, not necessarily intended for, for people space. A lot of times these are, are big box and they just need to hold down the membrane. Although the photo on the right here of a single ply, uh, we have a lot of those in the city of Chicago on apartment buildings and occasionally you might see a few people hanging out on, on this type of roof system. Again, really not intended for wear and tear for that type of use, but certainly you do see that happening. Back in the uh, you know, 60s and early 70s, we did see a lot of these extensive roof gardens being installed on, on buildings. This is uh, again, Lake Point Tower here in Chicago. It was great for you know, creating some habitat or you know, restoring you know, some sort of green area for people. Uh, these systems can help uh, filtrate acid rain out of the air or any kind of air pollutants that are, are blowing through kind of help capture that stuff. Uh, it can cut down on noise pollution. So if you're, you're hanging out in these spaces, you kind of lose yourself a little bit. So you're not, uh, you know, sitting out in a hard heart or outside in a hard environmental area. And sometimes you find that these areas will help have some th sort of therapeutic effects from being out in the presence of nature. Uh, these, however, are very costly uh, to install and repair. So you can see in this photo, they are doing some repair work up here on the membrane. Uh, luckily, they have to drain the entire pond, but essentially you could see where with these large canopies of trees that if there is an issue, it could really transform your space. Then in the mid 80s and early 90s, we did see uh, kind of this, what I consider a deck, not necessarily a, uh, a, a pedestal system, but uh, this is just kind of an extension of like a wood deck on your house where they put out slabs for people to go out and have, you know, a glass of wine or, or smoke a cigarette, but really, uh, kind of your basic outdoor space. So it lacked any kind of extensive uh, plant material, not very aesthetic. Um, and you can see in this photo, they actually took some paving units and stacked them up and put in some pots for some annual plant material. So it's not a permanent uh, you know, space, but uh, they're trying to green it up slightly. Um, again, usable, but not as people friendly as you'd like. I don't see any chairs or benches out here either. 
Then in the early 2000s, we started to see this uh, lead came in and, and really transformed our, our roofing in terms of having, uh, you know, some ecological benefits for reducing energy consumption for heating and cooling. Uh, the soil on these roofs will help absorb any kind of water so that can act as, you know, a, a temporary um, retention for, for rainwater. And also it, it uh, helps reduce uh, heat island mitigation. So this is uh, City Hall in Chicago. On the green side, the, the black roof side on the, on the bottom half there is actually the county side of the, the City Hall building. And they find that in the summertime that this difference between the temperature on these roofs is between 15 and 20 degrees. So it can be a, a huge uh, reduction in that uh, heat island mitigation. Um, this roof deck is not really used for people. They do have pathways up there to access the plant material as well as to go out and uh, put out their window washing equipment. So not really intended for uh, daily activity. Um, so these are great, but they you know lack usable activity area for, for people. And then we started to see this kind of merger, of this combination of the, the green roof as well as these outdoor deck areas. Uh, so they have you know the economical low grow plant material, uh, the succulent plants for the green roof side of it. Then they have the the concrete slab access walkways for you know more utilitarian. They put out some bench seating so people can sit out there and you know take a break during their lunch hour or, or whatnot. But it really missed any kind of movable furniture and key vertical elements to kind of give you that semi-private separation. So when we get to uh, this project up in Toronto, you see that it's uh, kind of a re-emergence of, of outdoor spaces. Uh, they're using that otherwise unused roofing space that may have just been a single ply or ballast roofing. Um, providing, this provides seasonal activity space. Uh, so you can go out there and do you know, aerobics classes or you could have uh, you know, wedding receptions, things like that, move the, the furniture around, any kind of partitions. So we found in, in uh, our different areas that this is great for attracting tenants in these rental markets that want to have, you know, community space to go up and hang out with friends. So these things are, are really uh, been, have done well in that rental market. Um, so when you kind of look at these different systems, the, the properly balanced combination of the, the extensive roof guard and the pedestal system, the green roof is what we would consider a rooftop amenity space. So it's kind of the best of everything. And that's really the focus of our, our presentation today. Um, and so to close out that uh, from that first slide I showed you with the pool deck or the pool area, this is the opposite end. And so this is your, what I would consider your kitchen area with the grill islands and your living room. And then at the opposite is the pool area for the activity. So uh, these are kind of the trends that we're seeing in the roof deck market where you have these different spaces divided up and these different rooms. And so we're gonna focus on how, how that uh, works. Um, you know, we kind of had our own organic evolution to the roof deck market. Uh, we started manufacturing, you know, small unit pavers for heavy duty applications and in, in roadways and plazas. And as our, our technology grew and got better, we started increasing the modular size of our pavers, which made sense to put those on uh, roof deck or outdoor amenity spaces. And with the combination of sheet walls and planters, those have also been included in that application. So you that additional uh, vertical element to put plants and seat walls. And then when we added natural stone and porcelain tile, we certainly saw an increase in, in uh, those materials for roofing decks. Uh, so to give you some examples of you know, things that started occurring back in the uh, 2000s, this is a project over at the Shedd Aquarium where it's their outdoor terrace for off their food courtyard. So people will go out here and have lunch and enjoy the skyline. They also do uh, activities in the evening for um, uh, jazzing at the shed um, every, every Wednesday, or they used to, of course, not this year. But these units here are, are 12 by 24 with the Umbrano model finish, so it gives you a nice uh, uh, variation. And then in this project was kind of unique because we were working with the landscape architect on the outdoor on-grade plaza and they use the 24 by 24 material in this checkerboard pattern and the architect wanted to do the same thing on the roof. So they incorporated a two and three quarter inch paver for that on the roof system for the outdoor area. And then in the uh, you know, mid uh, you know, 2000s here, we're starting to see this uh, 
this rental market and this is kind of the current trend where you have these different rooms of the the you know kind of passive hangout area the the kitchen you know grill area and then the activity at the other end so this is kind of the the thing that's attracting a lot of these tenants and we're even seeing some of the, uh, the you know private corporations add roof decks to their uh, facilities so that the people can get out and you know get some fresh air during that seasonal uh, weather that allows for that um, and we're seeing this all over the country. So this is a project in Boston. It shows you one from Toronto, Chicago, but we do have, you know, roof decks in all the different uh, areas that we're working on. Again, this is, uh, I think this is on the 10th floor of this building. So again, more of an extensive type roof deck uh, application. So some uh, basic uh, industry knowledge about technical references here. So this is a project, again, in Chicago. You can see the uh, John Hancock building back there. Again, photobombing my pictures. Uh, I got up on this building, and I was a little horrified when I saw some of these loose pavers sitting up there with just a two-by-four temporary, um, you know, uh, edging there to keep, you know, really people from falling over. But uh, I was concerned that some of these loose materials might uh, blow off the roof. So we'll talk about when later on in the presentation. Uh, some key things to note when you start working on these things, you always need to look at the structural components of your roof. So for most of these new buildings, I don't see it being so much of a problem because they do typically design for heavier loads, although you'll see some steel structures may not uh, have that. They're just enough to hold the single ply roofing and a ballast. Uh, typically, we see about 100 PSF for uh, these different loads for outdoor roof gardens. Um, you know, that may be a minimum. You may need to be higher than that for some projects. So always make sure you, you look at the structural component of your roofs. Um, we do work with several different membrane companies. So uh, keep in mind that, you know, a lot of times the owner will want to use a certain membrane because that's what he's used in the past. They may supply different materials. We have worked with all these different membrane companies out there. So certainly they can be incorporated into their overburden warranty if you have those kind of uh, requests from owners. Now, typically we see three types of systems being used on rooftops. So uh, the first one, slabs on pedestals, is probably the most commonly used, and there's some advantages to doing that. Uh, it's ease of maintenance for one. You can pick up the slabs, do any kind of roofing repairs, and put them back, and it, you know, virtually you won't see anything that's been done. Uh, also, the nice thing about uh, the slabs on pedestals, if you have a roof that has a um, you know, a quarter inch per foot slope, and they have, you know, it kind of goes up and down for the roof drains. This will allow you to have a completely flat application versus laying those slabs directly on the roof surface. Uh, the second option there would be slabs on a granular base. So this is probably the oldest system out there. You know, when they first started doing those extensive roof gardens, that's what they did. They just put down more granular material or soil and put the slabs on top of that. Like I said earlier, maintenance can be expensive because you got to pull out all that soil material to get to the membrane, but really it doesn't uh, have any size limitations to the slabs you can use. So you could use four by eight pavers all the way up to, you know, whatever size that you can find. So that's one advantage of that. And most recently, uh, we've seen slabs on a permeable chip. So the nice thing about slabs on a permeable chip, again, you can do different sizes, but then it allows the water to flow through um, and be into a granular base, but still allows supporting heavier loads. So if you have to have snow equipment across there, or you need a lift, a scissor lift to go up and change light bulbs, that can that can help out with that. And there's a term that's kind of floating around out there called blue roast for that detention capability. So this would be your typical pedestal application. And, and sometimes these uh, layers will vary depending on the, the needs of the project. But the, the base layer there is your concrete deck. They'll do uh, a, some sort of membrane on top of that, either a single ply or a hot liquid applied membrane. There may be a protection board and a drainage mat, depending on you know, the project needs. And a lot of times we'll see some insulation up there, 60 PSI for your, uh, your R value for insulation. And uh, occasionally we'll see this actually covered up with a um, you know, filter fabric, black filter fabric material, so you can't see through and see the blue, blue foam. But you really, your three components are the pavers, the pedestals, and the waterproofing protection. So those you need to have for this type of system. Here's an example of a project that was over a uh, golf course uh, locker room. 
and this actually has the blue foam for insulation and you can see below that they actually have a drainage mat filter fabric that will allow the water to flow off this and this is a, a seamless integration into pavers on grade so this actually turns around the corner here and then these are all sand set uh, slabs as well and so these are short little stackable pedestals used for this system your uh, typical section may look like this so you have uh, you know your cavity space there it's good to always indicate the you know finished floor elevation of your pavers as well as any kind of structural slab elevations as well and that's just kind of what uh, a typical section might look like here's a, a project reference during construction you can see they're using that blue foam to actually help elevate the slabs a little bit more um, they hadn't finished this so there was no uh, uh, you know guardrail around the outside uh, yet but uh, is currently in the process and made a great uh, illustration for the photo. Uh, and this is more like a deck application where they're doing pedestals. They did put down the, the uh, filter fabric or geotextile over the surface there to kind of hide the deck area. Uh, and they set the pedestals on pads and, and built up from there. The second option would be slabs over that uh, insulation or granular system. So uh, typically this will be a one inch sand setting bed which adds about 10 pounds per square foot to your roofing materials so keep that in mind and then you may see a, a geotextile fabric there to prevent the sand from flowing through or sometimes you'll see instead of the the insulation foam you'll see uh, a regular dense graded base material and they'll build that up um, to whatever thickness compact it like they would on grade do your sand setting material and then your pavers uh, here's a great example uh, where they've used that type of system and I believe this one is all on granular where there's very little insulation foam underneath this but what makes this nice is that you have three different paving unit sizes here so uh, you can see this big photo on the left here has kind of a spine that runs east west and those unit sizes are in the 12 by 24 inch in a running bond and then you have a six by 12 inch paver that kind of bisects that at a, uh, kind of a very unusual angle. And then in the semi-private spaces, you actually have a 16 by 16 paver uh, to create those little, uh, you know, private seating areas and grill islands. Um, so what, what would make this very challenging to do is use pedestals because you'd have three different grid sizes, a 16 by 16 grid, a six by six grid, and then you'd have a 12 by 12 grid size for the pedestals. And it would make it very expensive to do that. And really, uh, you know, anything under a 12 by 24 unit size probably is not a very good thing to use with pedestals. You just, they don't, uh, the, the cap of the pedestal is as big as the paver then. Um, but this works nice. And then you have those vertical elements in there that can go right on the deck or onto the granite material. The third option is the slabs on a, permeable system and this allows the water to flow through and be stored in the base material there and then eventually can flow into those uh, uh, roof drains. Here's an example where they used a 24 by 24 and they put in some temporary spacing there. Uh, photo on the right are 12 by 12 inch units so they weren't really designed to be a permeable paver but you can certainly do that with some temporary or plastic spacers in there. And then you can see it's all set on chips. And this is so they could drive out there with heavy duty snow equipment and scissor lifts to change light bulbs and whatnot. Uh, but the other thing that this allowed for is these organic planters. So to do these with pedestals, you have a lot of weird cuts in there, a lot of small little slivers. So by putting this on a granular, it's just like an on-grade application. It made the insulation a lot less expensive than, than doing it with pedestals. There are some uh, typical references to look out for out there. If you're looking for spec sections, you're going to find them in Division 7. Um, you know, roof ballast systems or roof decking systems will be in that 76 uh, subsection. And I have found, or when I at least look most recently, there were no ARCOM master specs for like kind of uh, pre-made for that section. Uh, we do offer uh, some through the Unilock website for, for our roof deck systems. Uh, and if you're looking for uh, the you know strength of the concrete slabs, we'll talk about that in a second, but that's ASTM C1782. That is really only for concrete products. So if you're working with porcelain or natural stone, they're gonna have their own standards. So with porcelain, um, you know, they're looking at ASTM 648, and that's for a much smaller stone. That's or a, a tile size. It's, you know, like, uh, 
like a one inch size. They do their breakage tests on that. So it does register very high. We'll talk a little bit more about breakage with the pedestal here in a little bit. And then, uh, you know, always look at the freeze thaw capabilities or whatever material it is, whether it's natural stone, concrete, or porcelain tile. In terms of cost, you know, there is a hierarchy of materials out there, so the prices can range quite a bit. So keep that in mind when you're selecting your materials, maybe have a couple options in mind so you can make sure it, it hits the budget. Uh, concrete typically will range from that 350 to $11 per square foot. Uh, natural stone, you know, we've seen it for thicknesses that are seven inch, inches around eight dollars a square foot or at least that's what we sell and then you know some of the granite materials or or stone materials that are uh, special materials could be as much as fifty dollars a square foot so keep that in mind uh, porcelain tile generally will be in that six to nine dollar range depending on what you're looking at those are two centimeter or five eighths of an inch thick which is pretty common. You might find some that are less than that, but you do want to be using at least the two centimeter uh, material. There is some three centimeter material out there as well. And again, as you go up in thickness, you, you'll increase that price. And then the wood decking, like the EPE type material, some of those could be, uh, you know, in that 12 to $14 price range. Again, it depends on uh, the actual type of material it is. So with the concrete manufacturer, we do have some, uh, standards that we like to look at. The C1782 is for measuring the flexural strength of the slab. And then the C1645 is the free saw durability. So in my climate here in Chicago, that's very important. So they'll put it in a uh, tank of saline solution. They'll fr freeze it for 50 cycles and it can have a certain amount of uh, dry weight loss. So it can have material fracture, fracturing or spalling off the surface. Uh, in terms of this, the test, the average PSI needs to be at least 725. So they'll measure three stones. Of those three stones, it has to be at least 725. The minimum has to be 650, otherwise it would be rejected. And that's for really anything over 101 square inches. So uh, there's a little bit of a gray area in our opinion. You know, a 12 by 12 slab is 144 square inches. We would consider that more a paver. According to this, we consider it a slab. So for Really, there's kind of this size from a uh, basically a 10 by 10 up to you know your uh, 16 by 16s that are kind of in that gray area. We test for mostly C936, which is more of a paper test, uh, where this looks at specifically the flexural strength test of the material. They'll put it on two rails, they'll put a, a load on it, and they'll press down on that until it snaps in half. So. These are uh, some third-party testing that I wanted to show you for our Kana slabs. These are 12 by 24 inch units, but they essentially will uh, make the size smaller for the test. And you can see here that the flexural strength in the, that first, uh, uh, on the left-hand side there shows that at average at 980 PSI. And then down below would be the compressive strengths for that slab, uh, which are around 994 20 with about a four and a half percent absorption for that. So when you have lower absorption, less expansion contraction. So that's very important for any materials, whether it's on a roof or on grade. And then the, the test result on the right is for a smaller unit paver, like a four by eight Holland stone type size. This is our Holland Premier paver. This is a, a 12,700 PSI. So these are two different tests that are being done. And so you kind of see how uh, those tests can change uh, based on the material uh, size. Absorption for the one on the right is close to 3.5%, 3.8%. And then I also have another test here. Uh, this is the Swanson test. So that's a inch and three quarter inch concrete flagstone that we make. And uh, I just wanted to see how it would perform. So with that, uh, if there's any questions now, Damon, maybe you can jump in here. Yeah, we've definitely got a few questions. Um, I'm sure as you were uh, jumping up and down on that, some people in the, the attendees were hoping it, hoping it might break. Just, <laughs> you, know, you never know, but um, yeah, so, 
have had a few questions. Um, the first one was uh, from D. Uh, does Chicago have a requirement that buildings, you know, need green roofs? I'm, I think a lot of places it, it really varies, but um, Chicago was specified, so. Yeah, they do actually. And I can't give you the specifics on it, but if you go to the, the City of Chicago website, you'd be able to find uh, information on it. Okay. They, they do actually have, I'm sorry, they do actually have uh, requirements for some building to have a certain amount of outdoor amenity space as well. Yeah, perfect. Um, and they also asked, uh, what make and model of filter fabric do you use? Um, I'm not sure if that, if you have a, a sole um, your vendor there or anything? Well, it, it depends on what the what your need is so like for when we do permeable pavers for like parking lots and and uh you know plaza areas they'll use a, a pretty light uh, uh non-woven geotextile that has a certain amount of infiltration or permeability through that system so um there's different brands out there i'm happy to um you know send something over to that person or if you if you go to our website you can download our printable paper spec there's some in there as well for these roof deck applications where they're covering up the blue foam you could just use any kind of black uh, um, even woven or non-woven fabric just to cover that up great um i've got a couple more i don't want to hold this up too much um alex asked if there is a uh, or if you could provide a you know a rough cough rough cost difference between the three applications, um, those being the, the pedestals, the granular base and, and permeable chips. Mm -hmm. um, if we could pause for that question, I will we'll talk a little bit about cost later on in the presentation and then we'll come back to that and I'll, I'll talk briefly about cost. Yeah, perfect. And uh, let's see, I know one of these other questions is coming up later as well. Um, we are getting to some of the pedestal specific information. So yeah, I think we'll just hold off on, uh, on those questions until then. Um, got one question from Jeff uh, about issues on de-ices on the roofing systems. And obviously depending on the, the design, are they accessible during winter? Uh, like mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Well, so uh, there's a couple of different things. There are, uh, you know, radiant heat systems you can use with uh, roof deck systems. So you put those on top of the pedestals and put your slab on that. So that's one way to address it. It adds cost, but certainly if the, the owner doesn't want to put chemicals out there, that's, that's another thing. With concrete uh, slabs, we certainly, um, we, we wanted to make sure they use, you know, de-icing chemicals, um, fairly conservative. We don't want to overdo it. Uh, typically rock salt, sodium chloride, or calcium chloride are the two best. Uh, I want to stress anything with magnesium in your de-icing chemicals is extremely harmful to concrete, any concrete, whether it's Unilock or, you know, poured in place. Uh, the amount of magnesium can really do damage to concrete, so stay away from that. In terms of how it affects the membrane, um, I think you'd want to speak to the different membrane companies about that and see if there is any concerns about de-icing chemicals for those. Yeah. I'm sure that's that's going to be really really handy information for uh, for people to know. Um, yeah, I think a lot of these other questions we'll be getting to, so I'll, I'll keep uh, you know I'll let you get back to it, and um, yeah, we'll see how we're going later on. Get okay. these other ones answered. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, so now we're going to talk about the different materials here. So we're talking about uh, concrete, natural stone, and porcelain. This is a photo of a uh, roof deck on the second floor of a building that was retrofit. Um, so it had a single ply system up there, and they built over the top with this porcelain, and they actually have a wood deck system underneath there. Um, so with the concrete uh, materials, you know, not all products are created apples to apples. There are different types of surface systems that are out there. So uh, we make several model blasted exposed granite which is a wash paver uh, smooth and then there's like flagstone type materials that are out there so some of the products that are out there actually have uh, stain resistant coatings built into the, the concrete mix so these can be integral or surface applied or both so keep that in mind when you're comparing products not everything is apples to apples um, the most common size that's out there for concrete is the 24 by 24 inch um, 
which is the nominal size. The actual size is closer to 23 and 7 eighths square. And there's different, um, you know, finishes for that as well. These typically weigh about 23, 22, 23 pounds per square foot. So that's going to cut into your, you know, your live loads for your roof decks. Um, and then there are some what we call oversized units that are out there. So some products you want to ask about oversized units, especially where you're going to have curved areas or if you're trying to retrofit and your, you know, walk pathways and things like that are not exactly the uh, right size. Instead of putting in, well, when I say right size, let's say it's a five foot walk, you, you may want to center those up. So you may have a six inch paver on each side. Uh, the oversize will come with either a false groove or without. And so then you can extend that edge just a little bit and then you can sacrifice or cut off any material you don't need. So those are 12 by 36 and, and 24 by 36 inch sizes. Uh, typically the spacer will be one eighth of an inch. So then it allows for uh, water to flow through there, but also um, will get you on a 24 inch center. So it aligns with the kind of building uh, sizes. There are other uh, size products out there, you know, ranging from two and three eighths to four inch thick material. Again, you got to look at the weight, you know, some um, uh, projects will need heavier pavers around the parapet wall for that wind uplift resistance. So you may need to go up in thickness to get a heavier product over there. So we do make some, uh, you know, two and three eighths that are uh, 21 by 35 inch, which is a really neat size for, for rough decks, kind of unusual. Again, that will come in different uh, finish options. Um, a two and three quarter, 32 pounds per square foot. And then, uh, oh, speaking of two and three quarters is kind of a, a seven centimeter paver, which is a very common size for our pavers on grade. So really any of our pavers on grade could be used technically on the roof deck application. And then the, the four inch, obviously 46 pounds per square foot. If you're looking at a two by two, those are gonna be a lot heavier and you're gonna need a couple people at least or uh, a vacuum system to set those in place. Um, some concrete pavers are made what we call a face mix or face mix technology. Uh, this is a two part process where the base is put in with a, a larger aggregate and then the surface is poured on top. It's vibrated and pressed so it cures together so there's no chance of delamination or the face popping off. It actually cures as an integral piece uh, to the, the pavement system. But this reduces on any kind of uh, wearing on the surface. It uses some of the higher end material like granite so it, you actually have a, a granite surface to it uh, so it'll never wear out or fade. Um, so these are really nice paver systems. Uh, this first one here is a blasted system. So it's shot blasted and then it's coated and it, uh, it has a little bit of a sparkle to it in the sunlight, um, but a nice smooth surface. This is a project looking overlooking uh, Lake Michigan right on Lakeshore Drive here in Chicago. Uh, this another project here where again, it's looking at uh, you have your kitchen area here on the right separated from your activity pool area, your lounge area. But again, this is uh, right around the pool deck. So has good slip resistance for things like that. Uh, this is one of my favorite projects on the, the west side of the city here where you're up about 22 floors above the west loop and it, you have a 180 degree panoramic of uh, downtown Chicago. Again, you can see the Sears Tower and the Hancock photobombing my picture here, but uh, it's a, a great space for this building called the Quarters at Lake and Aberdeen. And then this is a, uh, a project reference. So you can see the before shot in the upper uh, left-hand corner there. That was the existing conditions before they put down the, the Unilock material. And then they completely retrofitted this uh, uh, outdoor amenity space really to attract those different tenants for the building. So. Uh, they use the uh, same material, the Arcana material there for it. And then in the lower left hand or right hand corner, you do see uh, another photo of the before shot as well. Uh, another option would be the modeled surface. Uh, the nice thing about the modeled surface, it has some variation to it. So if you have these outdoor seating areas and people, you know, spill food on the surface, you're less likely to notice that, uh, you know, any kind of staining because it is modeled and so it kind of blends in with it. The nice thing about the, the different colors available for this is that, you know, light colors and warm colors will expand spaces and the darker and cool colors will contract the spaces. So it's a good thing to have a mixture depending on what you're trying to do for your, your rough deck areas. Uh, this is a small roof deck area using a dark gray midnight sky paper. So in my opinion, this really makes this look smaller than what it is. You can see that these uh, bench sitting out there, it's fairly wide. You can count across. There's about 20 feet here 
uh, but I think it looks smaller because of the color they used. Whereas uh, in this space here, they use the lighter color uh, paving material. These pathways are only six feet wide. And they have these tall walls uh, to kind of create that separate separation between the different uh, areas. And to me, this looks a little bit bigger than what it, it probably really is because uh, you know six feet is not that big of an area. Uh, exposed granite, again, is a, uh, you take crushed uh, granite material and it's embedded into the surface, so it cures with it. This is a project, again, in Chicago called Lakeshore East. It's been in since, uh, actually, before I started at Unilock over 15 years ago. Um, and this uh, still looks absolutely beautiful. But you can see the sparkle here at night, which is why I included this photo. These are uh, 6 by 12 inch units. Um, in this system. But the nice thing about this is you can have different size uh, granite for your material. So we have a, you know, a stock uh, uh, items for that, but certainly there's a lot of other variations. Uh, keep in mind that smaller fine aggregates will be more perceived as kind of a softer surface, even though it's, you know, a hard uh, exposed granite material. Uh, the larger, chunkier aggregates appear to be bold and strong. So we'll show you some examples of that here. Um, and then uh, again, the, the exposed granite material reflects the light. So you really have the two uh, best services there. You have granite material and concrete uh, working together to create a, a great material. And then kind of your uh, uh, more traditional smooth surface. Uh, this again is a, a face mix material. Um, and these come in a lot of different various uh, colors in both smooth or flagstone. So if you're looking for that type of material to, to kind of create a, a budget item with a flagstone, you can do that as well. And it gives you a lot of variation for color. Uh, here's a couple examples of some projects where they used uh, the light color material. It kind of looks like a beach. It's kind of that kind of warm sandy color uh, for this pool deck. And then uh, for this outdoor uh, seating area at a golf course, this has a blended paver, which is one of the nice thing about the smooth premier services or the, the flagstones, it, you can do blended surface. So again, if someone would spill out there and you weren't able to clean it up right away, it'd be less noticeable with that surface because of the, uh, the color variation. Although this paver actually has a, a coating on it. So it was sealed at our factory and it's gonna help resist any kind of uh, staining on those surfaces. Um, this uh, unfortunately is not a, a Unilock pro uh, product, but uh, it's a neat roof deck area. Although I just kind of want to point out here that, you know, when you're looking at comparing materials, you know, take a look at how they make it. So in this case, you can actually see a very repetitive pattern on the surface here. And when it rained, you can actually see where the water pulled up in the exact same place on these uh, slabs. So um, this manufacturer doesn't actually have a lot of, uh, you know, admixture in this. So there is some efflorescence on the surface. That's a white chalky material. So again, not everything is compared apples to apples when you're looking at uh, roof deck materials. Uh, natural stone weighs typically about uh, 12 pounds per square foot uh, for a one inch thick material. And this comes in various finishes um, and thicknesses as well. You can really customize this to your needs. Things to consider are your edges. You want to have saw cut edges so they fit nice on the pedestals. You want to make sure that uh, you, know, you don't use materials that are going to be slippery, especially around pool decks like a hone surface. And then there's some limitations to limestone and, and flame surfaces. Keep that in mind. Limestones really are not the best to be on pedestals because they can fracture easier than like a sandstone type material. And flaming will reduce some of the, the strength of the product. Uh, some of your sandstone and natural stone materials will have absorptions around you know, under 2% uh, with uh, your compressive strengths closer to 30,000 for that. There are many different uh, colors and textures out there. These are just some of the few of the, the sandstones and granite materials. Uh, certainly there's more out there. Uh, there's also bluestone materials that are really nice that uh, you can do on roof decks with flame systems. So again, they, they can, uh, you need to look at the thickness. This bluestone here from Buccini that we have is an inch and a half thick for, can be used on roof decks. This actual uh, a house that someone's uh, put in a sandstone material on the roof deck, two by two on pedestals. And this house had actually four roof decks with it. And so this is the one on the very top of it, looking over uh, Lincoln Park downtown, towards downtown Chicago. The third option would be your porcelain tile. This weighs about uh, nine pounds per square foot uh, for your two centimeter thick material. So you can see in this project, they actually have a very tall uh, glass uh, um, 
parapet wall or uh, guardrail on the outside there. So this would help prevent any kind of uh, material from flying off. These are all set on actually two by sixes and held in place um, on with pedestal tabs. So again, like uh, concrete and porcelain tile, they have their own, or like concrete and natural stone, porcelain tile has its own uh, strength requirements. So as I mentioned earlier, that C648 looks at a much smaller surface. So when you're looking at uh, porcelain tile, make sure that you you consider, you know, the size of the unit when you're placing your pedestals because they, they do have, uh, uh, they can break if you're not careful. If someone would drop something heavy on the surface, they can't crack in half uh, from dropping like something three feet tall, three feet above it uh, that weighs 10 pounds or more. So keep that in mind. Uh, but the uh, water absorption is the lowest, you know, 0.1%. Really, the water's not going to drain in through the product. It's going to go around the outside to the open joints. Um, you can wet set these as well, much like a natural stone. So, so that's something to consider as well. And then slip test. Not all porcelain is made to be outside. Some of it will have a much smoother surface. So make sure you look to make sure they meet that slip test because it can get slippery since the water doesn't get absorbed into it. It stays on the surface and, and can be slippery. Uh, there's a lot of different sizes and textures out there, uh, a lot of two by twos, and then there's some unusual sizes, in, you know, like eight, uh, 15 by or 16 by 32s, 16 by 48s, uh, 12 by 24. So again, you got to look at the size of it and look at your pedestal size with the system because that's going to add uh, cost as well. Uh, this is a Bradley Business Center where they have uh, two colors out here. They have a, a, the Gotham Nero and the Gotham Gray system for this roof deck. Again, you see a division of uses out here with uh, kind of your community space, bar area, uh, then the individual private uh, um, spaces at the far end. And then at the, at the other end closest to us here is your lounge area and eating areas with some AstroTurf. Now, the other neat thing about uh, the pedal system, you can do, like I said, uh, or porcelain, you can do it on pedestals or mortar set. Uh, you can put a dry set uh, application as well with a sand joint. So this here is a, a pool deck area where they have it on pedestals. And then um, on the semi-private deck areas, they've actually wet set this and grouted the joints. So all the water would either flow to a roof drain or flow off uh, off this. So they're using the exact same material for both applications here on this uh, these different semi-private areas. The porcelain industry does have some standards for how they, you know, want to have these set on roof decks. So they're showing both applications here, both a granular and a pedestal type system. Uh, again, they have similar layering as we mentioned earlier. So it just depends on your uh, project needs for that system. Um, and they do have actually some requirements for your, your pedestal uh, placement. Uh, this shows here with the red dots, you know, where you want to put those pedestals. So a two by two, you're showing them on the corners, but a, a, a 24 by 48 inch system, you actually have need to have some mid uh, slab supports for that. And then there are some contractors that will suggest doing a, uh, a support underneath the middle of the pavement or the slab, I have found that to be very challenging. Uh, some of the contractors don't want to do that, but uh, that is a way to add additional support. Our recommendation is that anything over three inches of cavity space probably should have some sort of backer. Some of the porcelain out there will have a, a mesh backer or a steel backer on that so that if someone does drop something, it's not going to shatter and someone's going to fall through. Um, or you can put a, another type of tray system underneath there. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to go into wood decking so much. There are a lot of nice options out there for EPA wood decking. They typically are fire rated for buildings, uh, but you should always check with your local building codes. In the city of Chicago here, they do have some requirements that uh, won't allow you to use the EPA decking, even though it's fire rated for buildings if they're adjacent to other structures. So keep that in mind. But they do offer a nice, warm, soft feel to your roof deck. Um, We'll talk about pedestals unless Damon, you have some questions you want to jump in here or we can keep going. No, let's keep going. Okay. The pedestal system, obviously we've talked about this. That's the system, you know, to support the slabs here. There's three types. There's the fixed height, which has a, uh, a base plate and a top plate. And then the contractor will cut a schedule 40 PVC to fit that height. So the beauty of this is the material cost is very low for that. 
but your labor costs are higher. So if you're working in uh, like a union type uh, installation, it may be cheaper to use a uh, adjustable pedestal versus this. But if you're non-union, you know, this might be a better option for you for cost, saving cost. This is an adjustable system, so it will help account for the slope of the roof with the um, slope correction that are built into these. And in this case, they have a single ply roofing and they had to use the foam blocks there to actually raise it up because they ordered the wrong size. So instead of shipping those back, they just put them on the foam there. These can be more expensive than your, your uh, fixed height, but certainly there's a lot of different manufacturers out there. So you can look around for different prices for your projects. Um, some have tools to help speed up the, the material uh, change in the height of it. Uh, these will range in, in uh, strengths from you know anything as low as a thousand per pedestal up to three or four thousand. So it depends on what you're doing and uh, what you need to support for that. So this has a factor of safety of three in it. So it's really about 3,300 pounds support. Uh, but you, you don't want to always uh, build to that. They all generally will have some sort of recycled polypropylene in those uh, systems, so you are getting some lead credit for that as well. And the height range will be from anywhere from an inch and a half up to 40 inches. Uh, different systems will have different ways to account for slopes. So some have top slope correctors, some will have bottom, some will have locking rings, things like that. Uh, spacer tabs can vary. They're could be some additional accessories for holding wood, things like that. So keep that in mind when you're comparing them. And typically they'll have uh, you know four or five units that will be adjustable uh, for the single size. And then anything above those, you'll have to add additional couplers or extenders on there to get through those different heights. Uh, generally up to about 24 inches, you do not need to have any kind of cross bracing. You go above 24 inches, you may need to start to think about uh, cross bracing as well. Uh, the Bison system is nice because they do have a, a adjustable base unit for that, so they can compensate for slope, uh, zero to five percent with that. But they also make a tray that can be locked down into the pedestal. So underneath the center of the pedestal, there's a tab that you can put a screw in, and they have these trays with a butyl tape on the surface there. You can stick the pores into that and then lock those down. So this will help with the wind up of resistance for that. And then the third option is a stackable pedestal. And these are like they sound, you basically stack these up in place. They come in usually uh, a quarter, half and three quarters of an inch and you can stack those to whatever you need. So as, if you have a quarter inch per slope foot, every uh, two, two foot sl uh, slab you put down, you're gonna need to go up a half inch. The, technically the smallest uh, uh, pedestal is that one on the far left there with this one eighth of an inch. And so you can see in this cross section here how you can step those up for your different units. Uh, so when you start to work on smaller unit sizes, you need to have more pedestals, which adds cost, which is why the 24 by 24 is the most efficient. Uh, when you're looking at um, design and layout, I always recommend a few things, you know, in terms of your, your drawings, make sure you have um, a good drawing that shows where these units are gonna go. So if you don't have a landscape plan, you may wanna put a roofing plan in there that shows, kind of indicates the area. It may not need to be colored, but at least uh, clean it up so you don't have all these string lines in there, things like that. So you can identify, identify stairwells, elevator shafts, any kind of supply rooms up there, things like that where you're not gonna have your pedestals. Um, and certainly you wanna indicate the finished floor, the roof drain elevations, any kind of ridge lines is always helpful. So you can see here, this doesn't have any uh, ridge lines and it does not have any drain locations or elevations. It's really purely a layout uh, drawing. So we've gone through and we've colorized this just to show you where the roof uh, slabs would go and how it fits in that space. So we started the layout in the upper left-hand corner and worked to our lower right. So you can see on the last row on the bottom, there's only half units in there. So you're gonna have to cut and add additional pedestals for those units. Uh, we do help incorporate uh, pedestal layout. So if you're looking to do a, a drawing, we need to have all that information to put out, um, you know, where these different heights go. So we're looking at roof drains and, and ridge elevations to kind of give you a range for those uh, pedestals. This makes it a lot easier for the contractor to install, you know, exactly where those units are gonna go. Um, here's a project overlooking uh, Grant Park in the city of Chicago where they actually core drilled through one of the slabs for a light. So those are things you can do with, with concrete slabs and uh, you know, incorporate those right into your system. 
we do have, uh, you know, wind uplift concerns. That's a big question we always get. And then the cost and layout. So I'll talk briefly about that. There are some industry standards out there. You can look at the FM Global uh, information and they do have these charts here that show you the wind speed and the height of the building and then what weight or pre you know, pressure you need to have, negative pressure to hold down those roofing systems. Uh, there's also a, a newer one out by um, ANSI and the single ply roofing industry, this RP4. And this is a summary of it. You should really read through this. But essentially, they have uh, standards up to 150 feet height, so about 15 stories uh, above grade. They have different parapet wall heights for that around the outside and then they show the uh, different exposure and wind speeds and this is specifically the one that I, I've called out here the system three is for a 22 pound per square foot 24 by 24 inch slab and so they have some specific requirements for that you know you need to have a containment around the outside meaning you need to have an angle bracket to hold down the outside edge well these are wind speeds listed here so if you're at on a building that's 150 feet tall and you have a, a uh, 12 inch parapet height for exposure C, the maximum wind speed allowed is 125 miles per hour. So keep that in mind if you're working in areas where wind can be an issue. Anything above 150 feet doesn't mean you can't do pedestals or slabs. You may need to do additional lockdown or use a heavier system. And there is a, a, a calculation do that's uh, uh, for that wind speed and wind depth left. Um, Bison's done a great job with their uh, trace system where they've actually gone out and engineered this for theirs. And you can see the negative uh, pressure zones for their system on this. So that is available for, for people to use when they're using bison pedestals and their trace system. In terms of, uh, uh, you know, example layout and cost as I've kind of been hinting about, we'll talk a little bit about this. Um, so if we're looking at just a small thousand square foot roof deck area, you're using a 24 by 24 option, you know, your cost of your roof slabs may be, let's say 10, it's on the higher side, $10 per square foot and your pedestal cost included, you'll, you'll probably be around $20,000 per square foot for your installation of a two by two. If for example, you were going to use a 12 by 24 where you have the pedestal grid at a 12 by 12 layout, you're going to use significantly more pedestals. You're looking at right around a thousand uh, pedestals, and so you're going to increase the cost by almost ten thousand dollars to go to that system. Now, going back to our question from earlier, uh, you know these different roof systems will vary based on several factors. So. Uh, we, we always like to see these going in when there's a tower crane up and they're still building the building because then they can hoist the material up onto the roof deck a lot quicker by full bundle. If they have to bring it up to the building, your labor costs and your insulation costs are going to go up significantly. So it's a hard item to answer in terms of, uh, you know, specific cost. Generally, we add about 8 to $10 per square foot depending on how it's being Hoist it up there for your labor to install these. And again, it really depends on what type of labor you're using, whether it's union or non-union union labor. So hopefully that answered your, your question on that, but uh, we can come back and revisit that if you'd like. And then the, the last section here, I'll go through quickly uh, regarding vertical elements. You know, it's always great to incorporate some vertical elements in your design. It really helps create additional seating areas. You can sit out there and, and read a book or whatever on the, the top of the wall, but it also helps delineate areas and create those semi-private rooms on your roof deck. Uh, this is one that's uh, looking directly across from uh, Wrigley Field, uh, but it also helps, you know, you could retrofit existing buildings with these walls and uh, make the, the spaces much more user-friendly with uh, these elevations and plant material. Uh, this Yukara wall that we make is ideal for roof decks because we do have different uh, options for that in terms of the backer block and then the fascia panel hangs off the backer block. So there's different uh, sizes of panels. There's a three inch, a six inch, and there's half units and corner units. And then it does have base units. So if you, can, if you need to, you can actually put the base units on a pedestal and build your wall that way. But the nice thing about this for designers, it gives you a lot of flexibility because of these walls and the wing walls. You can actually slide these units around into a, a running bond system, stack bond system. You can do asher patterns. And it also allows you to do a battered wall or you can do vertical and you can even actually do it so the face goes in and out. And that's done with a tongue and groove system you see there on the left. There's a tongue on top and a groove on the bottom that uh, there's actually three grooves on the bottom. Uh, 
but you can do fire tables with this. You can do uh, fire pits. You can do grill islands, all kinds of different things with this option. And uh, the beauty of it is these fascia panels are made on the same machines that our, our pavers are made on. So you have the exact same uh, finish that you do uh, for pavers on grade or slabs on grade as the, the fascia panels, which is nice. And then just this last year, we, we introduced a, a modular system that's made out of aluminum. Uh, so you can actually hang these panels on the system to create outdoor kitchens. So if you're retrofitting, you don't have the quite the capacity to hold these units for the backer blocks. You know, those can add literally a ton of weight to your surf, your roof deck. These uh, uh, systems for the, uh, the metal backing will save you a significant amount of weight for that, uh, which can be a big deal. Two guys can pick some of these things up and carry them and set them in place. This is prior to the granite countertop going on, but you can see how they've incorporated the grill uh, and uh, storage space as well as a refrigerator. Um, and so you can actually set these on pedestals as necessary to fit your space. So they're light enough you can do that and the pedestals are strong enough to support that. And there's other types of wall systems out there that you can use, whether it be a more of a, a modern look or a flagstone. Those are also available for RefDex as well. Any uh, additional questions? That's all I had. Yeah, we've got uh, quite a few questions and uh, depending on how, how long they take, because we're right on 11, um, sure. we might have to uh, to get some of these over to you, you know, after the presentation. Uh, yeah, feel free to email me if you have questions too. I'll, I can respond that way as well. My contact information is right here, so yeah. fire away. Yeah, so uh, Julie actually asked a, a really good question I don't think we we touched on. Um, what actually keeps the pedestal bases from shifting over time? Um, good question. So it's really the weight of it. Uh, you know, some pedestals will be made with a smooth surface on bottom so that they don't scuff the membrane. So uh, occasionally there, there are um, pedestal bases that will kind of give you a little bit more stick to it so it won't wear on the, the membrane, but also kind of provide protection so they don't slide or move around. But it's purely a weight. You know, these at 22 pounds are not going to move very much. Okay, great. And um... Dee actually had another question, um, she has a few, but uh, I'll try and keep to the shorter ones again. Um, what percentage of slope do you use for, you know, rooftop paper surfaces? Um, I guess, it, you know, is it different to typical uh, ground plane? Yeah, you know, typically on the ground plane, you know, you we like to pitch things one to 2% uh, minimum, but uh, you'll see a lot of stuff that's laid flatter than that. You know, 1% one, 1 is minimum just to get water to kind of to pitch and drain off. Anything less than that is going to stay on the surface. Uh, for these rough systems, typically they're laid pretty flat. They're laid, you know, when they put these in place, they're out there with a level, trying to level these things perfectly. So unless it's designed to have pitch to it, they're laid flat. The water that's going to go through uh, the open joints will hit the roof deck, which is usually typically at a quarter inch per foot, and that'll push the water to the roof drain. Awesome, thank you. Um, I'm trying to get to a few people. We had a few questions. Uh, sure. Amy actually had a question about um, the wind uplift systems, and you know, you kind of mentioned those. Um, but did you have anything that was not temperature sensitive? Um, how do you mean? You know, for wind uplift to resist that? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I should have I the, the, a little The bit. bison system there is the tray system they have with the butyl tape that um, is not a, a rating heat system. That tray is just purely there to help hold down the, the units. There's other ones in Chicago here. We saw a product called Elmich pedestals as well as the bison, but the Elmich have uh, two different systems. They have a concealed and a unconcealed tab on top. Um, to hold down the system as well. And then there's, there's other lockdown systems that are out there for, for pedestals. You know, our focus really is on the aesthetics of the system. So um, we don't see a lot of stuff that we need to have a lockdown system currently, although you can use our material with, the, with some of the lockdown systems that are out there. Okay, um, Amy actually had to jump off to, a, to another uh thing to do. So I, I don't want to necessarily ask too many more of her questions. Um, I think we can connect you guys later on today. Um, let's see. 
Uh, Jeff did actually have a question about um, the the labor costs as well. Um, okay. So if, if you had, you know, in, in trying to get those items up to, to the roof, and I, th I think you answered those a little bit, but if you wanted to elaborate maybe a little bit more on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, like I said, ideally, it's great if the tower crane's there and they can hoist those up. You know, some buildings that are, you know, two stories up, you might be able to just use a lift um, and articulate a lift and, and set the material up there. We've seen that on a few projects. But it's generally when they have to come through the building and they can only bring, you know, a handful of slabs at a time. They have to use the utility or the, uh, you know, the service elevator. That's where your costs really go up. So, again, if they can grab it uh, with the tower crane, that's going to be a big savings. In terms of the, the various costs, it, it really is based on the labor cost of, uh, how, you know, how far you have to wheel that material through the building to get it up there. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we still have a few questions and, and we are kind of a little over time. Um, a lot of the questions remaining are you know, very product specific or, or project specific. So I, I don't necessarily want to hold everyone um, you know, waiting on those. So uh, I think what we'll do is is kind of wrap things up. And um, for those who still have questions pending, don't worry. We have uh, have all these questions listed, and we'll get them over to uh, to Brad to. Um, yeah, I'll be happy to answer to you. as many as yeah. I can. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just just in finishing up today, I, you know, I I want to make sure that. You know, we've we've thanked Brad for for his time in getting this presentation um, dialed and and over to us. There was a lot of really great uh, content. It was a bit of a new topic focus for us, um, so I hope everyone was able to take something new from it. Um, we are, I guess, I'm making a little bit of an announcement too. Um, Brad will be back with us on July 10th, doing a, I guess, a bit of a mini series on on paving. Um, and he'll be focusing on permeable paving then. So just something to keep an eye out um, in the, the newsletters. The, our registration links will, of course, appear a little closer to the date, but just wanted to, to get that one out there. So um, yeah, as far as everything else goes, like I said, we'll get these questions over to Brad uh, a little later on today. And yeah, we are always posting this uh, webinar up on the website as well. So if you did have to run off early or if you want to rewatch or pass it on to anyone else who wasn't able to make it, um, just keep an eye out for, for that uh, on our webinars page. Um, but yeah, again, just want to thank Brad for his time in presenting today. And no, uh, thank you guys for allowing us to do this. We really, really appreciate it. And, and, you know, check out our stuff that's on Land FX as well. Yeah. So um, in, again, parting words. Thanks, Brad. And um, thanks, everyone. Yeah, we'll, we'll look forward to having you back on July, July 10th. Sounds good. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.